Okay. Um, it's two minutes past time. I want to welcome everyone that's here uh, from our audience and our panelists uh, in whatever latitude or elevation you find yourself on the globe. Wonderful to have you here again for the third seminar in the series of International Climate Webinars um, organized by the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts. My name is Dejan Lukic. I'm one of the core faculty members and co-organizers of this uh, series with Professor Bruce Glavovich from uh, New Zealand. Uh, we have a wonderful lineup today, uh, yet again. Uh, of the speakers from different parts of the world. We will begin with Professor Andreas Weber, who is right now in Italy, um, who will talk to us about atmosphere as breath and, and us as atmosphere, I assume. Uh, then we will continue with Chef Nephi Craig, who will speak from Western Apacheria in Arizona about colonialism as a shapeshifter figure and the indigenous perspectives that remedy damages of this violent figure. Um, and finally, a Maori leader, Piri Pikingi Varetini uh, from Aotearoa, New Zealand. He will talk about iconography of Maori spirituality, especially as it relates to a specific aphorism that he extracted which embodies interconnectedness to all life, of all life. And PDP is having some internet issues right now. He's trying to figure out and he will jump in, hopefully uh, at the right time at the end. Um, I appreciate you all being here, of course. And like I said, uh, for Andreas, it's evening. For Nephi, it's morning. Uh, uh, for PRP, it's uh, very early morning, um, so good to have you here at this time. So I'll let Andreas take over the screen now. Uh, we cannot see you, the audience, but we know you're here. Appreciate you're here. Um, Andreas will speak for 30 minutes, and then we will have 15 minutes time for questions and answer. This will happen after each presenter. I ask you to write your comments or questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box, that little Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom. You can find it there, and then I'll read it out loud for everyone. Andreas, please go ahead. OK, Sorry. yes. Yeah, thank you, Dehan. And I'm, I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. Um, and I'll try to I'll try to show um, why I think it is um, it would be good to understand the atmosphere as breath. And um, what you can see here on this in this first picture is probably what um, we would, roughly all agree is um, an image of the atmosphere. We are looking up, we're looking somehow in, in the distance at something blue, at something crisscrossed with um, anthropocenic signs, these um, jet trails. And it is. it seems to be somehow very far away. It's like a, a screen somewhere. Um, and now I want to show you another perspective on the atmosphere, which is this. So Dehan, you see, I'm I'm going right into what you were, su were already supposing would be my message to say that actually um, we have to consider ourselves as living beings as the atmosphere. And um, I'll, I'll show you. It, this is a little video, so please enjoy this little video. I'll show it. I show it to you. So it 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 has immediately some features which also belong to what is going on in the atmosphere or as the atmosphere.
So we see a butterfly with um, clear traces of a lived life on the wings. Um, in late summer on a cow parsley, um, a blue, although it's brown, but it's a blue um, taxonomically. And um, the butterfly um, drinks nectar and thereby is pollinating the flower. Um, and I would, yeah, would like to show the video again and please do something now. If you didn't do it already, um, while you watch it, go into your emotions or you could also say go into your heart go to your experience your feeling of of nature in bloom of the, the hate of summer maybe of late summer fading summer and while you watch it go try to go into this feeling And what I will try to um, explain in the remaining part of my lecture is that all these perspectives, all these elements, um, the blue sky, the transparent air, the blossom, the flower, the butterfly, and the, the experiencing self, which is in all this, are all parts of the picture, or they are all... Um, they are all equivalent perspectives on one undivisible whole. And it is interesting to see that um, in ancient Greek, uh, the word butterfly, psyche, psyche, did not only um, denote the, the insect, but was also the world the word for soul, which it is still psyche. But it is also the, the word for breath. Butterfly is soul and butterfly is breath. And I would really like to follow the profound wisdom of this poetic expression, of this poetic um, diversity in binding together different aspects of something which ultimately is profoundly related. So when we talk about the atmosphere, we open up other questions, which we actually have stopped to be asking or with, which the dominating scientific culture has stopped to be asking. What is a butterfly? What actually is a butterfly? What actually is a living being? Or what is life? No answer from biology. If you ask a biologist, he either either he is, he is a freak like me and he will start to give you his ideas, but um, in the in the major in the majority of cases, um, they will tell you that this question is too big for biology, so they, they don't think about it. And of course, what is soul? What is the self? What is our experiencing self? What is the experiencing self in the butterfly? And what actually is breath? So all these are questions which I, uh, in a sort of provocative tone here, um, assume, suggest that the dominating scientific paradigm does not know the answer for and actually does not want to look for the answer. And um, this leads to this bifurcation or this big binary, which you all know from your personal life and which we all know from our professional philosophical um, thinking and approaches that the world is split into the area of blind or dead matter or 
abstract concepts and the realm of meaning, which is not to be explained, which is somehow private, which is difficult to address and which David Chalmers in the mid 1990s framed as the hard problem of consciousness, the problem which um, the problem why why there is meaningful experience. And we could also say that it's a, it's the butterfly the butterfly problem, or it is the problem of the blue in the atmosphere, um, which which always comes when we think about these things, when we encounter these things, when we actually live these these things, these relations. But um, it has been pushed to the side by the dominant paradigm of explaining the world. So it has also been pushed aside by. Um, Contemporary climate science, of course, this is the blind spot in um, the dominant approach to the climate situation. So the question actually remains open. The question is, what actually is the atmosphere? Of course, everybody, most of you, all of you, stand up and say, okay, I'll explain you. It's this load of gases and uh, water and you know, you can characterize it on a chemical level, but um, that is not enough. And so we have to look again, or we have to look deeper, or we have to look not only from the outside, but we also have to look from the inside as we are um, intimately connected to the atmosphere because we are breathing beings. We are beings who um, create ourselves in togetherness with other beings, with all other beings by breath as being the atmosphere. Um, it, is, it is difficult to, um, to find this other approach, to find this um, experiential, relational, shared approach because we have been taught from early childhood on that um, we can only understand life, reality as such, and also life in it. If we separate it into um, distinct functional mechanical modules, what you see here is um, the, the classical simple model of a biological cell, of an organic cell, of a body cell, um, which Many kids have been taught taught in school. I have been confronted with this. I learned it like this. And when my son one day came home from school and presented me the same model, the cell as factory, I, um, I was actually shocked because I somehow optimistically had thought that this was something which um, belonged to, to my past and uh, the civilizational past, civilization's past, but it was not the case. So what you see here is um, um, is biology 101 in from mid grade school, and I, I, I think some of you probably have had this um, this image, this metaphor. This is taken from a, a real um, school test. Um, I left out the questions, but it's it's this is this is it's drawn after a real. Um, a real item. And you see that um, separation and um, industrial production and competition and top-down um, control reign this biological idea. And what you also see is that um, the body cell is fueled by carbon. Carbon is burned in order to generate energy. And we all know that this is obviously wrong. We are not eating carbon. And um, we don't have steam engines in our cells. But this also lends an image to how we conceive of the atmosphere, because the atmosphere is that which into which this exhaust pipe, this chimney, um, blows the, the waste, the gas, the, the, the smoke. And um, it's somewhere out there, and it it's it doesn't have at all anything to do with the living being. And um, I, I repeat again, this is it's not my 
It's not a caricature. It's not my ironic fantasy. This is what children learn in school. And then they are prepared to see in the atmosphere something which is very far away, which doesn't have really anything to do with them, and which is more something like a huge um, climate compressor, a huge air condition, which is which is also a thing which runs on fossil fuels. But in reality, um, a living being does not look like this. A living being um, looks like this. That's a spring meadow from uh, the area I'm, I'm right now at, I'm right now in, but it's not that far here. So this is still some time to go until it will look like this. And um, that's, that is the, the, re the reality of ecosystems. And as you, as you probably observe in yourself, um, when you look at this, um, you, there is a reaction in you. So you don't look at this in the same way you look at the model of the cell which burns carbon. Um, but you look at this in, in a much more relaxed or much more joyful way because you recognize yourself in the exchange in which you actually stand with the with living with the living biosphere so this this meadow is a place where um, a multitude of processes of creating their own identities exchange their matter through exchanging breath and this meadow wouldn't be possible if there was not the, the invisible phase above them, between them, under them, among them, which is the atmosphere, which is the, the phase in which all the bodies dissolve and all the bodies um, all the bodies break down in in order to become um, potential gifts for other bodies so that they can um, recreate themselves from these bodies. And what we see, um, as the the image of this process of exchange of bodies is this manifold colored um, elation causing um, even fragrant you don't you don't see the fragrance here because it's just a video screen fragrant inviting sensuous reality which is a phase I would say it's a phase of the atmosphere. Or take this, that's a shot I just did um, two hours ago um, of a cherry cherry tree, which starts to blossom. And in a way, you could even say that, um, as someone suggested to me once, that you see the same thing in two different phases. You see the atmosphere in its more abstract phase as this blue of the scattered light by the little water droplets. And you see it in its more uh, concrete, in its concrescent phase, as, as the blossoms, as the bark, as the wood. And um, let me go a little bit more deeply into this. Uh, this is probably still a bit general and a bit abstract when I, when I do this um, switch between the invisible and the visible. Um, what, I, what, I draw, what I drew here is the... It's a very simple, simplified version of um, something one could call the cycle of breath. And um, it is this cycle of breath it's, is happening between animals and plants, obviously. So we are also animals and we are fed by that which plants breathe out. We are fed by um, O2 the big O in, in, in double form um, by oxygen. We're breathing what plants give us and we're breathing out um, what, what in turn plants eat. So we're breathing out CO2 and plants eat it. And um, this CO2 is part of our body. What we breathe out is part of our body. And our body then becomes the plant's body. So what actually happens is um, that we can only exist because we, we are bound in this circle of exchange of our bodies with other 
members, other individuals, other participants of life. And only because we exchange our bodies, we can have our bodies. And um, in the end, our bodies are not even anything really solid. They are a process of, um, of flow. They are just a sort of nod um, through which matter flows by, the, by this ongoing circular um, mutual gifting of breath. And I have another little video um, because that's also something very powerful. I'll let you watch this just, just a second before I get into it. There is something very powerful. And you know, you can stand at the sea and suddenly realize that the sea is actually breathing. Like the rhythm of the waves is like the rhythm of the breath. And and like 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 the crest of the wave, the matter of each individual's body forms for a while and then transforms into other bodies, like waves crashing into one another. But and in the end, every body is part of the sea. So no wonder this, the experience of the shore, the experience of the waves, the play of the waves has such a profound impact on our on our own experience as as it points out uh, the way matter is shared is distributed be between all bodies and again it's um, this distribution this sharing could not happen without this invisible face in which the gift is given and we could also actually um, make the same um, make the same argument for the water as such. We can also say that we are, our bodies are actually integral parts of the watersheds and the rivers run through us. Our bodies are parts of the rivers. And if you look at the forms of your blood vessels, you'll see that they form little rivulets and bigger streams and huge streams because we drink the water from wells in the landscape, and then we give it back by uh, by sweating, by breathing, by peeing. It's it's going into 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 the remainder of the water. So there again, we have this um, the situation that we are somehow um, for a certain time desiring an independent shape, but at the same time only able to keep this shape because we share our realness with everyone else. And this, um, this is the, the scientific um, formulation of what I just said. And as I'm a biologist, I wanted to put in at least one formula. And um, what, but I mean, it's, it, you don't lose anything if you don't um, if you don't follow um, what I did there, and I will just quickly explain it. It shows the citrate cycle, cycle, which is the main metabolic cycle in our body cells, and um, and it actually shows this 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 um, this figure shows that um, the the CO two we breathe out in these pink um, circles. The CO2 which we breathe out is not the, the carbon. The carbon in the CO2 we breathe out is not the carbon which comes from the food. I, I left the German word there, Nahrung, food. So the food goes uh, is broken down and it goes into um, an intermediate chemical compound. And then this goes into the cycle. And um, and this from this cycle, um, there is carbon taken into the body and um, and there's also carbon from the body going into the cycle and then there's carbon from the body which is in the cycle going into the breath and going out and when i saw this for the first time i was really um, somehow shocked that nobody had told me in school because everybody used this metaphor that we are these um, little industrial complexes and are 
um, bodies are actually combustion machines and I'm filling the tank with um, rolls with ham or with, um, with, a, with a cup of coffee and it's burned and this gives me the energy and then some exhaust is going off. But it's this is not biologically not true. It's very fascinating to see that biologically um, we give ourselves away. In order to exist, we give ourselves away. It's very intriguing that um, this is the, the basic uh, way that our how our bodies exist by giving ourselves away and by being dependent on building ourselves up from other bodies. And again, you see, I love a little bit um, redundance um, to underscore this the element of um, experiential involvement. So again, this exchange of gifts is this what we see here. This is breath as exchange of gifts. And the, the involvement, our own involvement in this, our own personal, um, emotional um, involvement in this, in this, in viewing this, in being participant in, in, in this setting, in, in witnessing this, has to do something with the, the profound understanding of this giftedness of the mutual giftedness of our bodies to one another. And I, I'm going to skip this. So we are, um, we should not underestimate ourselves. That's a quote from Annes, the Norwegian um, depth ecologist and um, spinocist also actually. We should not underestimate ourselves. So we should not make ourselves smaller than we truly are, because we are actually um, also an ecological self, and the ecological self is extended into the whole biosphere. So this is also our self, and we, we should not cut ourselves off from this larger self, because then we will misunderstand everything. We will misunderstand ourselves, but we will also misunderstand reality. So we should um admit that we know more we can know more than we deem to know than we think to know and um if we deeply look at the at the term atmosphere um there is a, actually breath already in it because atmos 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 the greek word for mist and vapor is has the same root as the old Indo-German word for, which then in Sanskrit became Atman, which means breath and also the self, the mind, the soul maybe. And in German, it's very easy because German to breathe means is Atman. It's very obvious. Or Dutch Adam, I'm not sure if I pronounce it, pronounce it right, which is breath. And... Um, and let me allow me for the last remaining five minutes. I hope I still have five minutes um, to follow this. Um, let's say follow the Indian trek um, to gain a little bit more insight into actually the atmosphere as shared exchange of breath, which I would like to enlarge to reality as shared exchange of breath or reality as commons of breath. Maybe that that would be that would be the right term. So we we go to um, to the to the Indian subcontinent, and um, and I suggest to use um, a little bit playfully. I suggest to use um, a Buddhist model of reality, and to map on it the the little lessons our different perspective on organisms, which I presented before, um, taught us. 
And um, the, the beauty is, I, I need to go back because I, this is this I, this is what I need for what I what I want to say here. Um, in Buddhism, there is a term um, in, on the Buddhist path. Let's say on the Buddhist path, um, there is a term, the term pointing out reality, which is actually what the disciple tr strives to achieve. This, the disciple strives to understand reality as something profoundly shared as as not something con consisting of objects but something in which every being intimately participates and only because of this participation reality can exist and um and the word for the word for what the teacher is giving to this disciple is the pointing out instruction so my argument is, and that's what I want to try to do in the last slides, my argument is that actually any contact with the various forms, the atmosphere appears to us, be it as blue sky or be it as a sea of blossoms, is a pointing out instruction about the nature of reality as breath. So that's a... It's a huge endeavor for the last minutes, but I'll, I'll try to do it uh, quickly and playfully. So um, there are these three terms um, which characterize the the nature of the mind. The Buddhists say the nature of the mind, which is in uh, Rigpa in Tibetan. And uh, on the left side, I have the Sanskrit terms and the Tibetan terms. For these three aspects of the nature of the mind and on the right side i have the english translations which are always a bit difficult but i settle on these so this 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 reality some of you will for sure know it um has the character of emptiness of ego that's shunyata that's that's somehow the most most known and many will say actually buddhism is about emptiness but that's a bit coarse i would say so emptiness of ego um it's not empty of anything but it is empty of ego and then there's um the aspect of luminosity lalita or you could also say there it's all it's already difficult to translate um you could say playfulness you know the the freshness the sparklingness like when you remember this um the meadow with all these flowers that's the luminosity of um reality and then there's karuna um which often is translated with compassion and i would suggest to translate it with lovingness and um and let us have a look at how these aspects of the nature of the mind break down when we um, map them on certain aspects of the organism as, um, as this um, crest of the wave of shared embodied existence. So what about shunyata? What about empty, emptiness? An organism is empty because it has no fixed material substance. You see, that, that's a big blow to your ego because even if you look in the mirror and you feel okay about how you look, it's everything you see is not yours because it's you will breathe it out and it will go into the body of other beings. So an organism has no kernel. In metabolism, the world is passing through it, only temporarily unfolded in an individual form. The corn on the field will be my flesh and my flesh will be breathed out and breathed in by a tree, be an acorn at the end of next summer. So an organism is that process or that experience which realizes the world in mutual transformation with others. So there's, there's emptiness in being an organism, which is somehow shocking, but it's also usually relieving and that's maybe this the blue sky is a very good example for this emptiness because you can look up you can look up there and and it's actually you it is what you have been and it is what you will become and i think it's a nice little exercise to do this um to see that 
we are also there or we are there and we find ourselves there. And so the second is luminosity, Lalita. And because an organism is always manifesting in new forms, it's always changing, it's always playing, it's always um it's always an experience it's 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 not just dull it's meaningful um it's it's a hard problem to speak with david chalmers it's about feeling it's about being in, existentially involved there's nothing which doesn't have a meaning everything is somehow sparkling with its own glittering freshness and of course the luminosity is what what springs to our eyes, what springs to our senses, what we what we what enraptures us and we don't understand why we don't we're not able to formulate it. We are we are we just we just immerse ourselves in it and um and when we try to find a, an explanation in the scientific dominating scientific paradigm we are we are very helpless. And then there's karuna lovingness. And um, that's the most profound aspect, the most profound idea. And it has to do with the, with the, with the observation that the organism is from, from some invisible center always brought forth in its own embodiment. The organism is gifted to itself like you know like the experience like when you 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 cut yourself with a knife by preparing dinner and um after some days your wound has closed in the miraculous way so so your 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 healing is somehow gifted to yourself and there is an there is an a pull a desire that there be life which manifests through organism which is manifest as an action, which is a self-realization as happening and as experience, and which is what gives life to others. So my own realization but as a breathing being, breathing in and breathing out is also giving life to others. So that's the aspect of lovingness. And all this, all this is, is part of um, the common of commons of breath and the atmosphere. So this this is my token image for the lovingness, and um, as um, as this is also always an experience. This is always an experience which is profoundly shared. Yeah. So I hope um, I could make some of my ideas clear in this um, quick run to through the atmosphere as. Um, as yourself, as myself, and as an inner process, as a process of mutual creation. And um, no, I leave this. I leave this. And so I thank you a lot for your for your attention. You see, this is another version of your breath. This wonderful early summer butterfly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andreas. Um, I, I invite the audience members to pose a question or, or a comment. Feel free to write it in the Q&A section. Um, if you can just stop sharing the screen, Andreas. Oh, true. Yes. And, and uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just ask you uh, something first uh, uh, from your from your talk, which was very clear uh, and very beautiful, uh, related to the words that uh, you opened up uh, for us and that that you brought into blossoming. Uh, this the within the idea of us as atmosphere, um, I was reminded that the word conspire etymologically means literally to breathe together. Mm -hmm. So this is very curious and it, it just made me think, listening to you, is at us as atmosphere, is that a given biological fact? 
which seems that it is, as you were showing with the rhythm of the waves is, or the rhythm of breathing and so many other examples, or does it necessitate us to conspire in some sense, mm. politically or metabolically, I'm not sure, conspire in order to achieve this unity? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's you gave me another word which I can use. Thank you so much. I, I, you know, I remember when, because I didn't find it myself when when a colleague pointed me out to the fact that psyche doesn't only mean breath and only mean butterfly and soul, but also breath. I didn't know it, so he told me, and then I was, you know, my my whole universe opened up. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very good question because it also touches on, it actually touches on the question. Um, if if there can be something as the right behavior, um, which if there can be something like the right behavior, which nonetheless is non-deterministic, and um, let me let me see how I can put it. I, I would say the 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 role of the role of human beings is to actively, consciously implement through their culture, what they understand um, the, the, the fecund, the fertile reality needs to receive. So, so we, we, we are not, as we know, we are free to decide. And at the moment, um, some, <laughs> some very powerful beings decide that they uh, do not want to breathe together. And um, humans are free to decide, but the, their role for most of the time humans have existed on earth has been to actively participate in the mutual gift giving which brings forth life so we we actually humans actually need to conspire the 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 blue butterfly which was a brown butterfly and the cow parsley they just do it and it, it is probably a profound meditative experience to be a blue butterfly, you know. And um, they don't need to be told. They don't need to conspire. They just do it. Or you can say on, on the, the level of their the desires of their bodies, they do it anyway. And I, also, we do it anyway on the level of our bodies. But, but we can counteract it. And um, so, so we need a decision to do it. And um, that was the... In, in I would say in all traditional societies and indigenous societies, humans conceive of themselves as those who have to protect life. And um, by, by conspiring um, to breathe their body into the bodies of others. And we don't do it. Our civilization doesn't do it. Yes, nicely said. Uh, it, it seems now listening to you and, and showing us that pedagogical little uh, drawing, uh, it seems to me that there's a lot that we actually do have to learn. It's not instinctual. Even the invitation in the beginning, when you said, uh, uh, get into your feeling of late bloom, I, I had to force myself because mm -hmm. it's not instinctual, but it yeah. seems crucial that and yeah. and just this the idea that it's possible to get into to summon that feeling so it, it seems that it's something that we have to learn yeah um we have to we have to i would say we have to remember mm -hmm. and i think the problem is you, you know when you when you say i had to you had to force yourself you really had to search I hope you could find a little bit of it. You know, you you probably also were surprised in this setting because we are in a scientific setting where you're not supposed to to work with this dimension, and I'm 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 always doing it. So I'm I'm somehow going against the rules because nobody is expecting this. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I'm actually um, my my argument is that um, we have a faculty of knowledge, um, which which is which is very potent. And we don't use it um, because we have been told that that we cannot use it. We must not use it. It's forbidden, and that's 
um, you, certain certain mystical traditions would, would would call it the heart. The heart is is we we know this through the heart, and we know when we see this butterfly, our heart is touched, and and then we 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 have a certain knowledge. And um, the problem only is that our everyone who is who is introduced into this culture has to unlearn this knowledge. So we, we it's it's you could, and I've I've done this in some writing. This is also a process of colonization. Our heart is colonized by 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 heartlessness, and um, so we can unlearn this. I don't think. I mean, we what we have to learn, and and that's the somehow the 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 the, the, the enigma about humans. What we have to learn is to create a culture um, which which institutionalizes this or which plays with this with with our life giving potential. But the feeling that it is right to do so is something which which we are capable of. I would really say it is more a question of remembering than a question of discovering new new terrains. And um, there comes something to my mind. Um, some um, it's interesting. I mean, it's it's typically it's not a it's not a um, I have to I have to look. It's not a biologist who said it, but it's a it's a um, politologist who was um, a pioneer in, in in human rights, Abdulaziz Said, and he said the ecological function of the human being is love. And love, you know, what is love? What well, love is actually the active decision to allow for life of others. That's love. So, so that's the ecological function, and many traditional societies know this. So they know they are actually responsible to to keep the ecological balance through their actions, through their ways they they take lives, through rituals, through increase, and because we are we are we are forced to do it actively, but we also can do it actively. We can decide. We can take the decision. You know, love love is. Love as the act of giving life is something that you can decide to do. You can say, I, I'm, I'm going to act in a loving way. So I will actually protect these beings because they need to be here. And um, that's something a culture can develop. And, and if you look at our culture and the, the, hidden, um, the hidden paradigms which govern it, then it's just the contrary of it. It's just, it's just, just the contrary of... Um, breathing life into other beings it's just it's taking life from other beings and you even learn it by by self-help books you know how to better be, be um, competitive and take the breath from others so it's the contrary of what we're doing but it can be done i think this is actually the the huge cultural endeavor to 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 recreate a culture which enjoys to give which enjoys to give life I hear you. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions. Uh, Maria Walsh, a, a, a couple of provocative questions, and I'll co connect it with the second one from Kate Farrington because it relates to it. I'm not sure if you can see it yourself, Andreas, but I'll read them in any case. What about? I can, yeah, I can see it. I'll just read it just so that everyone can hear it too, because I'm not sure if everyone can see it. What about the shared exchange of breath between toxic environmental entities implied by the flight paths of the first image? How can that be addressed by this mode? Humans and plants also breathe in and out toxicities. And then the second question from Kate is, what effect does the introduction of to toxicity in the atmosphere from industrialization have on the capacity for great compassion, where mutual gifts may not necessarily cause no harm? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, very important. Very important. Yeah, so, so, um, and thank you for calling this my model. <laughs> it's nice. It gives a sort of scientific touch to it. <laughs> yeah, so it's important to see that, that, um, you know, actually the, the circle of the gift will always happen because this is how reality is organized. But you can do it in a toxic way, and you use the word toxic. And you know, you know, everybody knows the second meaning which has gone again the word toxic in terms of ruining relationships. So what is it is absolutely possible 
that you um, you you free ride on this circle of the gift, and um, instead of giving, you're taking. But it's still it's still somehow wrapped into the circle of the gift, which means that others who are implied in the circle of the gift will still consider it as a circle of the gift, and they will die. That's that's actually what is happening. You know, humans. I uh, don't want to use uh, what how how can I say it? participants in the dominant culture. They're they're free riding on the circle of the gift. You know, when when you when you always take and never give back, and then you're then you're abusing it and you're creating toxic relationships. This is happening, of course, and um, but it doesn't mean that um, the the circle of breath um, is not a valid description. You know, when it can be abused, it 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 rather points to the fact that we need to understand the nature of reality in order to contribute to it in a in a productive way and you know it is actually it's it's let me come back to this again Dejan, you started with this um it's it's some important aspect of the status of our um of of human accountability and of the human role in terms of freedom actually so normally there are these two competing ab absolutistic polar opposites that either humans are completely free and then it is also free what they think about reality because in the end they are always constructing and creating something and um, on on some sort of mute background and the other model is actually everything is deterministic and we're somehow biological machines and um, our creations are um, sort of epiphenomena on, on some um, deterministic inevitable process. Um, and I'm actually suggesting something in the middle. I'm suggesting that, of, of course, um, there are there, there is a there is an unfolding of reality going on which we are part of and which we do not control. And the unfolding is the unfolding of life over time and the desire for life over time. Um, and we have the choice if we want to participate in this or we don't want to participate in this. And um, we are given our existence. So it would be um, somehow uh, morally logical to give back to this to this reality, which gives us our existence. So Robin Wall Kimmerer, the, the, the botanist and indigenous writer and wonderful philosopher, she has a nicer way to put it. She says, if you um, sustain those who sustain you, the world will go on forever. So it, it is actually, we do have a choice, but not because everything is arbitrary and we can choose anything. Just, just this is not the case. The world is not arbitrary. So we can actually... We can actually be blinded and choose what is not true. And then that's what our civilization is doing. And this, this will mean that we will um, vanish from the picture. Indeed. I'll just uh, summarize quickly the uh, a third question uh, so that we can go on, um, which basically asks, have have we lost this ability to respond to the questions you are now asking because we have lost the language to do so? Namely, do we need a new language uh, to enter this paradigm? Mm. No, I don't think so. I'm always wary of new languages. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, and, um, and, and traditional cultures have traditional languages and they still are in this paradigm and i mean we if we look at these languages then we might learn something but you know we go back to ancient greek this is not a new language and we we know that they understand actually the butterfly as breathing soul and we we know everything so actually no i don't think so we just have to map our language to um, what is there in a better way excellent thank you very much andreas um, we will move on now to uh, Nephi. If you can, Nephi, please, you can join with your video. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andreas. There's a further comment. Uh, you can see a couple of more comments uh, yes, there. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Nephi. Uh, welcome. From, uh, embedded in the White Mountains of Arizona, I assume. Uh, I'll give you the screen now. Go ahead. <clears throat> That was a, an awesome presentation. Thank you for that. Um, I felt numerous parts of that. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nephi Craig. <clears throat> I'm coming to you from the White Mountain Apache Tribe in Northeastern Arizona. Um, it is a uh, very windy afternoon here and I have a, a message to share um, relating to this topic and many others. The title for my presentation that I put together for us today is trauma, violence, and internalized supremacy. I will just kind of read my description. Um, so description is indigenous paradigms view colonialism as a shapeshifter or a monster with a violent appetite for life. Colonization rages blindly to remain in power while devouring our world. This session presents colonization as the act of violence and colonialism as the behavioral health pandemic that ensues. Indigenous perspectives, values, and intergenerational vitality offer remedy and place-based renewal. Uh, <clears throat> I'm presenting this, this presentation to not as an artistic provocation. I'm presenting this information as a singular paradigm within a larger indigenous reality. I am very fortunate to be able to communicate in the oppressor's language, which is English. I am unfortunate that I cannot commute and communicate this in my indigenous language, Apache or Navajo. And that has been a wound all my life. <clears throat> this message is really a dispatch from the underground. Um, it's a dispatch of a subculture, of a subculture, of a subculture, of a subculture, of another subculture. If you are not a member of the BIPOC community worldwide, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you, may, you might not completely relate to what I'm gonna say. Um, and again, this is not to be provocative. This is a climatological imperative because climate change and the detriments associated with globalization and the pandemic of colonization and the disease of colonialism is worldwide. Um, the perspectives that I offer and the terms that I choose to use, they are uh, framed by um, by many disciplines. I'm I'm. I do not consider myself an expert. I consider myself a student of this experience. I've been fortunate to learn many things in my journey. Um, much of my perspective is framed by being a cook professionally. Um, but as an indigenous person doing much travel and study and interaction with not only my own people on the White Mountain Apache tribe and the Navajo Nation, but also tribes from the California coast up into the Northwest coast, into the, into the Great Plains, into the Dakotas, into the East coast and the West coast, down into Mexico and up into Canada. Um, we all experience trauma as a barrier and not just trauma in our contemporary lives. Trauma is a intergenerational uh, barrier that impacts everything from fundamental artistic expression to access to education, access to care, uh, access to awareness of this webinar that is a climatological imperative. Uh, trauma is a barrier in many ways that when it, it uh, enters our life, it weaves itself into the fabric of our genetics and disintegrates some of those strands. And this is a message that is framed by my years of practice as a professional cook. Um, it is framed by my perspective as a father of three indigenous young people that I'm very proud of and I love very much. Um, 
And it's also an amplification of an angst that is intergenerational. The amplification of an angst and desire to amplify the indigenous message of vitality, strength, humility, and power. And not power as you might uh, experience it or understand it, but power is the lack of power. Power is the internalization that we are powerless, therefore making us powerful, that we are humble um, contributors, contributors to this reality. Like, on, like Andrea said, be in the atmosphere. So my, my perspective is that of a practitioner and a student. I am 44 years old and I've been fortunate to travel around the world cooking. My, my paradigm for this message is, is shaped and framed by being a dad, by being a cook, by being a clinician, um, by being a resurgent, by being an indigenous resurgent, by being a skateboarder, a lifelong skateboarder, um, by a punk rocker and a, a hip hop head. Um, I've always identified with the voices of the underground because I did not know that I was from the underground. My, my perspective is framed and is, is also informed by the language of social work, behavioral health, mental health, indigeneity, uh, survivants, because I feel for many years of my life, I was living in survival mode. Through addiction and recovery, I've been fortunate to transcend survival mode into evolve into survivants which I feel is creatively utilizing those traumatic experiences, my street smarts, my creativity, my resiliency for a better life. Uh, my paradigm and my message and the language I speak is framed by therapy culture because I'm now a clinician. My, my, my paradigm and my message is framed by being a, um, a chef of many years um, and definitely a person in sobriety. Recovery is a, a, a huge, component in my life. I've been clean and sober for the past 12 and a half years. It'll be 13 years this year. So as indigenous people and as one indigenous person expressing my voice and my, my uh, um, perspective and a message that <clears throat> this phenomenon of colonialism is worldwide. <clears throat> as indigenous peoples, we've seen the world end once and myself and my children are survivors of that apocalypse. And our paradigm, our perspective on worldview of being interconnected and having humility as our, as our power is one that we, will, we love to share, but we often are not given the, given the, the opportunity. Um, so with that, I'm very, very happy to be able to share here today. Um, as an example, as an indigenous person, we know and recognize that um, if you are not a member, if you're not an indigenous person or not a member of the BIPOC community, you, don't, you do not have to learn anything about us. You do not have to learn anything about me as an Apache person. You do not have to learn anything about my culture and my language, and that's a luxury. You don't have to learn anything about my language, our, our experience with trauma, um, our interactions, our post-colonial post encounters with co colonialism, and that's a privilege and it's a luxury. We know that you don't have to learn about our true history as indigenous peoples in the United States and worldwide. And those are luxuries, those are privileges. Yet from our pers perspective, in order to survive, in order to just break through the bare minimum standard of living that is not in poverty, we have to learn everything about your language. We have to learn about your culture. I am speaking in the language of the oppressor. We have to learn the structures. We, ha we have to learn from your institutions. We have to put away deep pieces of our identity in order to thrive in dominant society, not just in the United States, although it is very much a, a red alert state for oppression of indigenous peoples today. And those are forms of trauma. 
um, not just in the United States, but every single indigenous pocket of resurgence and resilience, every indigenous community around the world, every community that is that has a, a core ailment of poverty and oppression and marginalization. Um, so I'm challenging your perspective in what you know and what you think you know. The perspective of how as a person of color internalized supremacy being the concept of this, this, um, this presentation I'm offering is it's similar to the concept of internalized oppression. And I want to just kind of share what that means. Internalized oppression is a psychological phenomenon where members of an oppressed group come to believe and accept the ne negative stereotypes and prejudices that dominant groups hold above them. And this internalized state is where we begin to believe the language and the violence of our pressure of our oppressors, um, where we begin to act them out. And in my case, now years later with the clarity of recovery and sobriety, I know that my own addiction that began in my youth uh, is not a, um, it's not a um, hereditary um, genealogical defect of any kind. Um, we're not genetically predisposed to addiction, alcoholism, incarceration. It's just that therapy culture, dominant society, institutions, and the power structures dismiss the legacy of historical trauma that we have inherited, that we did not create, that we have inherited. And so as a kid, I realize now looking back that the manifestation of white supremacy, racism, injustice, colonization, globalization, and all of these negative branches of the colonial monster materialized in my life as incarceration, addiction, and near-death experiences. So I offer a message that this phenomenon I'm referring to as internalized supremacy, here's a Here's the a definition of internalized uh, or of white supremacy. It's the belief that the white race is superior to all other races and should dominate society. And it's a political, economic, cultural system that maintains dominance and privilege of white people over other racial groups. And even as I speak this right now, I know I feel I feel danger in my heart. I feel it in my veins. I feel it in my mind. My pressure level is going up. The cortisol is being released because I know talking about these concepts is dangerous because of the world that I exist in. I exist in your world. So the concept of internalized oppression, what does that mean if we're talking about internalized supremacy? That means that we begin not only just non-native people, so if we've eternalized oppression, we, be, we believe the messages we receive, and then we buy into it and promote those themes, we're contributing, we're complacent, we're accomplice to this, in, this, uh, to this state of violence that's, that's ravaging our world. Like I said, in, from the indigenous perspective, everything is alive, everything has a life. The words that I'm choosing to speak they are floating around in the universe and they're waiting for me to draw them down and communicate. And like I said, I'm not communicating this to be provocative artistically in any sense. This is a dispatch. This is a, it's, it's not a desperate cry for, for help. It's a responsible presentation that colonialism has brought on this, um, <clears throat> climatological imperative we're talking about today and challenging our paradigms to disengage and consider how can we live in a new, in a world where we are in recovery ourselves, recovery from internalized oppression, recovery from internalized supremacy to live in a better world. The dominance and how the Americas was built on indigenous landscapes is the supreme example of how colonization is a monster in our, our grandparents' generation and our great-great-grandparents' generation. 
And yet we still continue to internalize the themes of the power structures that we, we benefit from. Um, and to not really give breath and life to a healthier reality. And these concepts begin in our homes. They begin in our own individual lives. To talk, uh, to use really big words like uh, climatological imperative is, um, it, 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 it's wonderful and amazing, but what does that mean in your everyday life? I, I challenge us as practitioners, professionals, artists, parents, and once upon a time, little kids to examine how we are being complacent to the monster of colonialism. It is a machine that is ravaging to devour. It is the machine that has been on the necks of indigenous peoples for centuries. And as we move forward into an uncertain future with a very delicate food system, a very delicate power structure, at least in the United States, we feel the tension socially, economically, uh, epidemiologically, um, in all different ways of how this uh, population change is, is occurring. The power structures are merging. And so, for example, in the American Southwest, the United States Census predicts that by the year 2050, the majority is going to be uh, Black, Brown, Indigenous people of color. Um, it's not going to, it's no longer going to be a white majority. And by 2050, uh, 2050 and beyond, most of the United States of America will be brown, like me. <laughs> and so the change is coming. And I hope that we can consider a message of individual, familial, psychological wellness so we can pull back and disengage from colonial violence that we know and feel in our hearts when we encounter it. And I challenge us as artists, practitioners, parents, and professionals to investigate the true histories of the landscapes where you live. Because like this, like this description said, indigenous perspective values, intergenerational vitality, offer remedy and place-based renewal. It's not going to be a automatic utopian fix. It's gonna be intergenerational. The wounds that, we've, that we live with today are intergenerational and the remedies are going to be intergenerational. But we do have the ability to be cycle breakers in our families. And that is what matters the most. That until this day, you had no idea who I was or where I'm coming from or the message, the, the translated message of the indigenous experience. And after this, you may not think of me ever again, and that's a privilege. But what I hope you do think about is this climatological imperative and how we have the opportunity to shape our world at home. Because I'm coming to you from my own house. There are objects on these shelves behind me that represent beautiful moments in my life. Your home, my home, is your own space of heaven, piece of heaven, the reality you create. And that's where impact matters the most. So I encourage you to examine power structures around you, to challenge the perceptions and paradigms that dominate our practice. Every single construct in the artistic world, the therapeutic world, the political world, the literary world, the legal world are all framed, framed created by, and they're colonial constructs. And with that, those colonial constructs comes those themes of internalized supremacy, that a legal system that is colonial in nature is much better than ind indigenous justice, that it is much better and more effective than indigenous justice is. And even the medical field is catching up to indigenous worldview and practice. The concept of interconnectedness is something that we've known and we still talk about every single day. The, the humanity as breath or atmosphere is just as important and valid as something like my eagle feathers here that are given to me and hold power only because I believe that they do. So in this 
description, when, when the idea SVA asked me to present, I kind of had an anxiety attack. Like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna say? How do, how do I reach a professional audience with this message? I'm afraid it's dangerous to speak. Who's gonna think what, am I gonna hurt some feelings? <laughs> and, and that's just how I am because I, I do my best to be a responsible presenter and professional. Um, my life has really changed and the message that I'm attempting to translate and offer to you is one of accountability and responsibility. Um, there are numerous indigenous professionals that write about uh, indigenous resurgence, decolonization, mental health, uh, wellness, uh, many, many great authors and, and professionals out there. And so there is, I'm not the one sole voice. My perspective does not represent my entire White Mount Apache tribe or the Navajo Nation. But as I mentioned in the beginning, my perspective and the message I offer is framed and informed by interacting with food. Um, I, I arrived at these messages and themes by surviving white supremacy. I arrived at the opportunity to create this message and the work that we do now by surviving oppression by learning how to navigate paradigms and epistemologies to be able to exist in your world. And that has been very, very hard. It, it has almost killed me. It almost killed me 13 years ago. And so I live a life in second sight and I offer a, 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 an intimate message that may possibly the highest art form is the art of being human. <laughs> it, it's the art of self-determination. How we interact in the world and how we shape and mold our spirits is, is a profound poetic, it's poetry in motion. It's the art form of our life. What sculpture are we gonna leave in the minds of other people that we were? How do we create an impact and leave a legacy that reweaves and heals those genetic strands of trauma and grief in our lives? It's by disengaging from colonial violence. It's by feeding our families better food. It's by responsible purchasing and understanding our purchasing power as consumers. It's by amplifying indigenous voices, black clinical psychologists, indigenous psychologists, social work, giving life and resources to education, mental health, behavioral health, and themes to help heal as opposed to be punitive because the, the the power structure is like it's like i mentioned in the beginning it's a monster with a violent appetite for life and it is fighting to survive it's ravaging and tearing through our our reality it's breaking our hearts it's causing divorces it's contributing to uh it's contributing to the preventable food related diseases it's contributing to the pandemic it's contributing to every single element of global warming in our lives. So I offer a very kind but diligent solution or remedy, and that's one of taking care of yourself. So you can be the, you can be the resource that we need. If you attended and logged onto this webinar, there was a part of you that is drawn towards vitality, creativity, and understanding this blurry, sometimes often dismal and grim reality that we call life on earth. And to be able to offer some clarity because clarity through a lens of interaction, I'm not telling you how to live. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm doing the best to translate the broken heart that I live with on a daily basis into terms that offer inspiration that can hopefully leave a mark and can challenge you to engage in this quote unquote highest art form of being human because that's what it is. And fortunately, if colonial violence, oppression, racism, white supremacy are learned behaviors, then that means we can unlearn them. And a brighter path towards Remedying some of these themes of social change and damage requires us that we that we live what we're talking. Um, I learned this the hard way through sobriety, is that 
if I am not living what I'm talking about, then I am empty. So being able to examine our reality and see how we have been engaging in colonial violence and investigating how we can impact our world. These are, it's kind of like that concept of thinking internationally, but acting locally. And so, and maybe that could be said that we are thinking externally, but acting internally, because whatever we think and whatever we believe and how we construct our spirit is going to show up on the outside. And so I offer trauma, violence, and internalized supremacy as a reality, not as a theory. Um, I offer it as an ethno-poetic interpretation um, of my existence, of a survivor and one that's able to thrive now. Um, and when I say ethno-poetic, I mean that it does not need to be categorized, that it just needs to be experienced. I've been struggling for many, many, many years to understand what category my work fits in as a chef. I'm an addiction substance abuse counselor. I'm an advanced certified relapse prevention specialist. I'm a behavioral health technician and I'm an executive chef with 26 years experience. I'm also an indigenous resurgent and a father and my work does not fit in any one of those fields. Uh, I'm, I'm against the grain by nature, not for the, again, not for the sake of being antagonistic, but just that forging my own path has brought me to you today. And I'm very grateful for that. So I'm sharing this message and this theme and encouraging you to take care of yourself as we continue to investigate these, these deep and meaningful questions that will impact generations to come. And <clears throat> From my life on the White Mountain Apache tribe uh, and growing up on both the White Mountain Apache tribe and the Navajo Nation, uh, when I speak, I'm, I see the smiles of my, my relatives. I see the poverty in my neighborhoods. And every day on a daily basis, I work with and encounter White Mountain Apache people and other Native American people that I know from experience are suffering the, the, the uh, manifestations of intergenerational grief and the shapeshifter that is colonialism. So in conclusion, I ask us to think if, if colonization is the act of violence and colonialism is the disease that sets in across generations like an, like an epidemic and a pandemic, then what is the symptomology of colonialism? It's internalized supremacy, internalized oppression, violence. A recovery mentor said to me once, when language fails, violence becomes the language. And if that is the case, then this climatological imperative we're discussing is fueled by lack of language. It's not that it doesn't exist, that it, it's that we have turned our back on it. And so the messages are all there and ready for us to use. They're just very terrifying. It's scary to change your life. It's scary to walk into the unknown and know that there is life after divorce, that there is life after the death of a loved one, that there is life after incarceration. But the fight to transcend survival mode into survivance is where we are on a global scale. And to me, that is poetry in motion. That is what makes this life beautiful and worth fighting for. So I wanna thank you for inviting me and listening to me speak. Again, I'm not an authority, I'm a practitioner. I'm in the trenches, on the ground, on the res, and I'm a proud, happy parent, a man in recovery. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nephi, very much. Uh, we'll just have uh, uh, some questions here um, uh, before we jump into PDP. Uh, who I'm happy to see as well. It managed to uh, find the connection. Um, really fantastic uh, engagement, Nephi. I, I have to say, against the grain is where the health lies. So we we invited you because you are against the grain. Um, 
I appreciate very much your subculture within subculture within subculture, uh, minor within minor within the minor. And that too is where the main juice lies and the vitality lies. So uh, uh, we are privileged to hear you on this. Um, I'll read a couple of questions and then I'll let uh, uh, Andreas also say uh, something uh, if, if he has. So we have some questions. This is from Nandita. Thank you for a powerful presentation. Riveting. The question is to connect with Andreas's idea of breath. How do we breathe with difficult others? Draw in, conspire, inspire. How is it possible? For those of us in the US, it connects to everyday encounters. So how, how, the question is how do we, uh, I guess, communicate and, and breathe together with those that would disagree yeah i i get asked that question in many forms all the time and it always always come back to intelligent coexistence um i think uh when we speak to the mind we reach the mind when we speak to the person we reach to the person but when we speak to the heart we reach the heart kind of a simple mantra um having a sense of humility and trying to meet people where they are this discussion this discussion and my presentation um, some people may not be ready for it, and that's okay. We are all on a different journey um, and encountering different themes in our process towards health and wellness. So that that's one of the best ways I can answer without taking too long. Thank you. And so the following question, I, it relates to that just on a more technical level. Within the role of therapist counselor, how do you resist the power riddle structures language of behavioral health? For instance, the categorization, diagnosis of mental illness and the related problems of stigma, et cetera. So the language I, yeah, that you mentioned. I, I really appreciate that question because that, 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 that was a realization of mine early on. I almost, you know, it was so powerful and striking to me that I almost quit as a clinician because I realized that I'm doing the business of the state. I'm doing the business of the colonizer that Western constructs and therapy culture are more damaging to ind indigenous values than beneficial. So walking a fine line of indigeneity and clinical culture has been the struggle. Fortunately for me and my work, the food, the hands-on nature, and the behavioral health components of being a part of a team in a kitchen or a cafe that we operate as a vocational center or offering agricultural farm visits, or being able to go out into the field to harvest traditional wild Apache foods offers a language that is inherent that we can't teach. And we call that behavioral activation of indigeneity. So maybe to not to make it indigenous specific, it's behavioral activation is the language we need to focus on. Mm, that's excellent. I, I I just want to add to that. You mentioned that the remedy remedy and overcoming is intergenerational because the trauma is intergenerational, which means that you have to have you're forced to have this enormous or overwhelming view of some remedies in the future, uh, which seems to me enormous. But you're also dealing with remedies day to day, I guess, with just sheer nourishment and being precise with the nourishment of food and stuff like that. Am I correct? Yeah, and it. I feel like that's the beauty of working with food. And when I when I offered, um, when I challenged and offered tools and perceptions to enhance, and ho hopefully someday answer some of these questions we're talking about today. You know, please, please include food. Uh, please include what we choose to feed our families and the stories and histories attached to those food, foods, because these points and all these things that I've, I've been presenting that shape my perspective, I'm, I'm not a, I, I followed the food and I survived all of this to be able to communicate like this. So the food has been my biggest teacher. So I offer that to you as another tool. Excellent. I'll let the panelists may, uh, give a comment if they, if they have any. Um, yeah, may, maybe just just a, a, a wholehearted agreement with Nefi. Thank you so much for 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 your moving account. I'm 
really really thank thanks from my heart and you know when you said when we when we speak from the heart and to the heart and then we we meet the heart so actually it's that would also be i mean that no let's say it's 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 for me it is so convincing and i i love it that you take take on this 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 heart dimension because i think this is just what is what is missing you know when when you if you ask me what is wrong with this world i would say it is it is heartless it is heartless and if we go into our heart then we cannot be but true and nourishing life and if others don't do this we can, we can still be true and nourishing life and 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 i think that's and be true means also to to see our own ego protective mechanisms and 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 not fall to fall for them so it's it's a lot of exercise but to me the heart is the key actually the, the the power of the heart so thank you for that and really thank you for your presentation so so much uh, thank you. Appreciate that. excellent so i will move on to philippi now our final speaker and if you all have uh energy to stay a little bit afterwards as well for uh another short session of discussions that would be fantastic uh andreas and nephi and then um we'll invite a few others so thanks nephi uh pdp good to see you um I, you probably didn't see andreas's first image when he was presenting but it was a sky with the long blue uh, with the long uh, white cloud uh which is i think the place where you are coming to us uh, right now so i invite you to take over the screen if you need me to share uh, the documents that you send me i can do that as well just let me know uh, please unmute yourself and you're good to go Just unmute yourself, PDP. Unmute. Unmute yourself. Oh, perfect. Thank, thank you, Andreas, for the long white cloud. <laughs> and uh, immediately I'm thinking as long as it's not the wrong white crowd. Yeah, sorry, I just, you know, Tinakotu Katoa. Greetings to you all. So uh, I'm just going to start off with a karikya, which is a prayer, an incantation. And I'll share, I want to share a whole bunch of things, but I also want to say that it's absolutely uh, a pleasure to be here and uh, serendipitous as well. You wouldn't believe, uh, I'm just going to share the document here what it's taken to get here. Seriously, so I'm going to talk about people passing the land remains. And I'm also going to talk about koha, which is gifting. So this prayer is an incantation of ascending and connecting heaven and earth, our environments. I'm sure I'll, I'll call uh, the gentleman that I'm so pleased to be speaking with, with Nephi and Andreas, hey brothers, uh, Jedi, Jedi Knights. So, uh, and then I'll talk about gifting. So here's the prayer. So there's been a whole lot of serendipity blocks, numerous blocks right up to this minute. I mean, the whole system that I had fell down and I had to say to, to the brother Dian, oh man, I hope I can make, but here we are. So here's the cut here. Te neo, te neo, te hoka inu ku te hoka i rangi. Te hoka ina taku tūpuna tāne nui a rangi, piki te aite rangi tū hā hā ki te tihi o manu. I roko hina tu rāko i o matua kore ana ki. I riro anga ke tō te wānanga ko te ke te tūwa, i riko te ke te tūwa, te ko te ke te aroni ni. Te iri, te iri ai paupa wai kia papatuni ku kāpita ko te ira tanga piki te whai au i te o mārama tihei mauri oi. So now we've got the connectivity to above and below, metaphysical and physical. So with Pepeha, we identify ourselves with the connections to the land, connections to the land. So here's one. A ko tainu i te waka, ko kari o i te manga, ko whaingaro te moana, ko ho o te ro te tangata. Tainu i āwhiro nga nguru te ao, nguru te po. Roaring by day, roaring by night. 
that's looking out for my brother's house. And he's listening, killed on my brother. We're roaming again, by the way, roaming again. So the next thing to do when we connect to the land from the heavens is to connect through our ancestry. So the two canoes here, Tainui Waka, on the west coast of the North Island of the of Aotearoa, New Zealand, and on the east coast, Horauta Waka. So I go with the male line first. There's a traffic jam there. You won't need to know all those details, and here I am. So, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. These are words from my grandfather. Ko tā koutou mō kai tēnei, me atu ane kia koutou. I'm your humble, I'm humble to be here and to serve you. A name what e tēnei means to be a servant of many. It's my grandfather. When he uh, taught me to be an orator on our speaking uh, marae, in front of our long houses, our meeting houses, he always said to me, it must be the words that you open every oration with. I'm here to serve you all. So, tēnā pauta kātika. So, when we, after that, we go to our whare into our meeting houses. And you saw mum's side and dad's side that I came down on those lines. So, which side do we do? If you look at the meeting house, on the left-hand side, that's dad's. On the right-hand side, that's mum's. And at the top, that's our ancestor who's the chief, and I just took you through the chief, and before that was right up the top to the actual creator of all things. And then it comes down to the person sitting here right in front of you. So when we look at the inside of the meeting house, the inside there is that's the female. That's where we sleep, that's where we're safe, and it's a world of darkness in terms of the spiritual metaphysical realms that women can connect to. And outside here on the speaker's platform where I am now, that's uh, the area of the men. So there's that, that balance that goes right there. And the balance I'm talking about is the balance between heaven and earth, which is our template for the, the balance of the male element up top there and then the female element down below here. That's uh, our meeting house. And on the left there, you can see that column. That's the male. On the right here, female. And here's the ancestor up there. On the inside of the meeting house, when you look in there, there's a female at the front, the male's at the back for a good reason, and that's the interior here. This tells all of our stories from all of our ancestors and up here and how to conduct our lives. And as you go up on the meeting house, that'll tell you about how to lead your spiritual template. To see that as we look up at the cosmos and the environment and our relationship, and then how we ground her with our mother. And the cool thing is knowing that your mothers, 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 your fathers, fathers, fathers have all slept in this house. Mm. So that that there is called an umbilical cord. When we see that pattern inside the meeting house, it connects us to the land. It's the same uh, name that we have, Fenua, for afterbirth. All of my grandchildren's uh, afterbirths are in the land of my brother, in that land that we look down on that water and at that mountain. So the ukai po, ukai po is to be breakfast at night in that body, in that house. So it's like the land that suckled me as a baby. It sustains me now because I'm connected to the land as an adult, mm, to hold, kind, to eat or imbibe and in the night. It's a metaphor for Mother Earth as Papa Tuanuku, as the mother of all algorithms. So, so it ties together an environment. And I come back to that core that's that uh, opening statement of my talk. The faces of people are lost. And that's a cycle, but the land remains. People pass, but the land remains. So she's watching us. She does. She likes to be clothed with all our forests and all our lakes, but she doesn't like to be naked. She doesn't like to be burnt, and she does not want to be drowned. So the matapi, the eyes that peer out of that parinui, We've got a, one of my students, she's a fierce grandmother, man, fierce. And she's looking to re reconnect because there was a disconnection uh, at a generational cost. At 1840, when we had our treaty with the white people who came here, the Pākehā, 
100% of our people spoke the language. 97% of the of the nation spoke the language, which meant that, you know, they had to uh, engage economically with us. So they had to learn the language. Now only 1% of, of uh, my people can speak. And so the country can speak and 3% of my people can speak our own language, live and die without speaking our own language. So uh, this this fear student, he says, yeah, but are the eyes looking out or are they looking in? So we look at the atu, which goes to the creator above, however you see that, to our ancestors at the top of the house, to the person standing and speaking on behalf of the tribe, and then to the children's 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 children. So if we look at the mother, and I want to really focus on mother, women are the houses of life. Women are the houses of death. Women are the houses of humanity. They give life, they birth. The kōpō te whenua, they're the womb and the land. They're the waitapu puna waikoro pupu, the sacred pool of life, it's effervescent. Maya papatuana from Mother Earth. The kōpō te whenua, from within the womb, from within the womb. The waiyo te tapu, it's sacred. And there's that, that design that I've shown you where we're connected from an umbilical cord to the land that we come from. We are the land, the land is us. Right? So it goes from the creator, comes down to the ancestors on top of your house, your meeting house, comes down to the person who's in front, and then to the children's children's children as a legacy. Yeah, the queer. Well, what's that one right on top? And as I said, the upokoaruki, the metaphysical head of creation. Come straight down to the metaphysical head on top of the on top of the meeting house, which is our ancestors, and then it comes down to baskets of knowledge that were passed on. That prayer that I gave you was about the spiritual, mental, physical, and personal personal connection to the land and to the people beyond darkness into the light of awareness, and then into growth and development, and then on to humility. There is no darkness darker than that of ignorance. Ignorance is a dark room because you don't even know what you're missing. That's our granddaughter, one of our granddaughters, beautiful mother. <clears throat> so you stand in the light and growth, then humility, and that's that figure at the top. And you go through the legacies from top in the heavens that ground us here. And you have a co marker the the speakers on the platform that stand and they take that arm and it drops down to where they are on each side of the house, male, female, and it takes it up. So they become the conduit to the heavens. They're the physical manifestation of what's going on and what's passed through time, the annals of time. Like a two feet of when we open our house, do we when do we do it? Well we do it in dark and we do it in light. So we start early in the morning. So you can get together the night and the day, the manatana, the tane, the manawahine. You get the two elements of our male and female counterparts. Yeah. And there it is. So but, well, what's the difference between who sits on, who gets to speak on your behalf? Are they just adults or are they just adolescents? Are they middle-aged adolescents? And then we look for our geronites with the ability and the knowledge. And I'll come back to that. Why not both sides, he says. Who do I deem to be these komat with these geronites? They have mana enhancing decision. That means you, whoever you think is your leader, that's your leader. It's not just by noise. People hear your words, but they follow who you are. When you get a branch, you rub all the rubbish out and you lift them with the hardwood, with the hardwood. And I just say, you know, if I wanted some bananas, I could have gone down the shop, but I'd rather make a maraka, I'd rather nephi, and I'd rather harvest the fruit. So when I go into battle, that requires due diligence to be at my best. I don't want to be goofy. So I don't want to have goofy standing next to me. Kariri taya, hakata maire, chief strike, falls to the. And why she says, well, is it age specific? Well, it's the difference between ordinary, noir, and extraordinary tapu. The bye bye tapu. What's the difference? What's the difference? As you go up with that prayer, ka oke oke titi matang, we o matu koreanake. So you ascend, you ascend, you transcend. So that incantation, it helps to transcend from ordinary to extraordinary, making a difference. So when we welcome people to our land, our air, our water, we have settlers' rights. We say, this is how it rolls. 
So we are the people of the land. So yeah, we set the policy and procedure. Our health and safety is tough. And they're the value systems of why we do things. As we see the celestial template, the ancestral template, and then we have our terrestrial template on what we do. So it modifies our behavior without being a, a modifier. It's a spiritual modifier. And once you're compliant and you become like us and we're the same, well, we can happily coexist. So, Jedi Knights, welcome my head to bulk, I use the forks. So, Andreas, killed a brother, the atmosphere is breath. The Earth's atmosphere is mostly understood, as you say, it's meant to be a reservoir of nothing, dead matter, okay, and not alive. So, getting that balance is right. The heavens, the earth, but the atmosphere is not lifeless. I love that in you, brother. Thank you so much. It is rather our sense of a shared life, collective breath, the phasal breath, and it establishes this full reciprocity between all individual living subjects. You look up to the sky. We understand ourselves. We look down at Papa Tunukurai. And the only difference is the individuals, the dividers, that divide heaven and earth. But why aren't we joined? So in each we breathe into one another. Tihe modi or tihe winuni. So we look at that knowledge again, and in our prayer we sow everything. Tuiyairuna, tuiyairado, tuiyairoto, tuiyairoto. Karoma te po, karoma te a. Tu, 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 Little feet. So that tihe, you know, euphemistically they say to the white guys, it's a, it's a sneeze. But you can call it a sneeze of life, but in about nine months' time, you might have some little feet running along. Yeah. Take care of that. Nephi, my brother, former violence, internalized supremacy, indigenous paradigms, colonizers, shapeshifters, or monsters. I hate you, residential school, dinner settlement, colonization, ripping things out and taking just, man. Somebody stop me, I tell you. So before the arrival of Pākehā, one of our Māori seers, he said, He tui te awe mā para he tangata te māne e noho te taone he mā. Behind the tattooed face a stranger stands, he will inherit this world and he is white. And so Peter Buck, he, he, he softened and he said, Oh yeah, he will inhabit them, this land and he is untattooed. Now that that sounds pretty pretty neutral, right? But we as Māori know, he has no legitimacy, no identity, no purchase in, cult, in a cultural sense. Right? What happened to his, where's his pepeha? What's his mountain? What's his waterway? Where's his whakapapa? What brings him from the earth and grounds him down here now? That's what he was really saying. Okay, you might know all that stuff. Okay. He 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 we have this capability to be great, to be connected or not. It is death. It is death. It is death. When our ancestors said that people will pass, but the land will remain, they never, ever, 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 ever had a single thought that humanity could ever threaten divinity. You know, and it's another thing. That I go with both of my, my Jedi brothers. Me. When curriculum meets Te Ao Māori, or indigenous way of viewing the world, there's always going to be a distortion because of this addiction to define abstract qualities. do not turn to the path there outside. So that talks about the enduring presence of the land despite the transient nature of people. And I says our ancestors could not have anticipated the extent to which human actions could imperil the sacred essence of nature. He aituwa, he aituwa. And if we fail to recognize it, it's over. It is over. Yeah. So there's this reciprocity and sustaining life. When we talk about that about koha at the end there. So kohai, who are you? Who are you? Who, 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 who? From what waterway do you descend? What's your pepe? What's your identity? What's your connectivity to the land, the environment, and the ecosystem? How's mum? She's our mother. How's your mum? Where does your mum live? How is she? She got clothes? She fed? She warm? She watered? 
Has mom. It's her mom. Papa Tuan with the mother of all algorithms. Tao kyo kiti ti matanga ko yee o matu kore ana kiti pu ko te weo ko te mo ko te ak. Ti he mauri o. So, C.S. Lewis, pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is the megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So this song, E Pa To Ho, is an account of a massacre. You know, Rangi Alfia is a church in 1864, not that long ago, and had abundance. We were exporting to Australia 400 loaves of bread a day. Yeah, oh, sorry, at one time in the oven, right? Ma, Māori, Pā, we lived there happily. The Anglicans were there, the Catholics were there, and you know, it wasn't Ireland exactly, but they, they seemed to get on. It was peaceful. Then the British officers, they knew that, oh, look, there's only women and old people and children. Does it sound familiar? It was only women, old people, and children. Does it sound familiar? It was only women, children, and old people. Now, at the battle, our men had gone off to fight other fights, right? And so on that morning, the 21st of February, 1864, the power was sacked and the British soldiers smashed the place. Burnt the church while we were in church. And as the kids ran out on fire, they shot them. So the survivors fled and, and they went, but they got killed off by the diseases that they had contracted from the, the blankets that were infested. That, that. So here's the wild time. E pato ho, he wini hira do. He ho mai aroha, ke atangi atu aui konei. He aroha ki te iwi, ka momo tikita fiti ki pa e rau. Ko ai e ki te atu, kei hea aku ho i mu araha. I te tonu i tanga, ka hara mai tēnei tātau e he, ka ranga i te au. This was our marae and whaingaroa on the mountain, as you saw, we see. And during the war, uh, the war mongers said, watch out for the yellow peril. So they smashed our big meeting house down to make an airdrome to watch out for the yellow peril that never came with these bulldozers. My brother and I used to go floundering. See that symbol on the left there? That is a flounder, pratiki. When it's perpendicular like that in the Milky Way, it's visible by the uh, naked eye. It means that the uh, it's not a time for plenty, but as the cosmos move and it's parallel, then now you can see that it's time for for the harvest. So my brother's here. Surprise, I woke him up and went and said, brother, you might want to listen to this. He's my hero. I love him with all my heart. And uh, yeah. We're out floundering again, my brother with the tilly lamp and the spear. We're going roaming and we've found some friends. We can bring them home for some bread and tea. But in Lalo Lalo Te Tangata Toi Tui Te Whenua, people pass and the land remains. So your koha, your koha, your gifting, the serendipity of even being here amongst you all, and, and I'm so honoured to be here. I am so honoured to be here. But trust me, I risk everything to be here and speaking with you. It's serendipity that we have probably spelt it wrong, right? but I risked everything to be here in so many, so many ways. But I'm glad to be here. I don't want to mean to, to, to be dramatic, but it's the truth. So the koha is ta koha, a ta is from print like a, like a, like a tattooed face. Yeah. It's impossible, it's possible to define faces like the tax department. They want to know if there's revenue, man, how can we tax that? So I'm talking about aroha. Aroha is the key element to gifting in, in the Māori world. Aroha is composed of two key elements in lines of thought. Aroha is to move towards hard the truth of who you are. There are no hidden corners. There are no hidden corners. 
They never heard the phone. There's no half truths. You can't have half a, a truth. And that can be defined as integrity, presenting as an open book and being guided as you move towards the essence of self, self-truth, internalizing your self-truth. You can't be truthful to the self. How the hell can you be truthful out there? That's true love. Right? And then koha, koha, koha is to spotlight something. Koha, my walk is tainui. Koha, my mountain is kariwa. Koha, my motion and waterway is whaingaroa. Koha, my river is whaingui. And it goes on. So once again, the how represents the true self of who you are, the real you. So if you mash up this word caught the spotlight with the how, the energy, now you can pass it out. And that represents a disruption of time, energy, and resources. We willingly give to an individual, a collective, an organization, or a cause. So finally, importantly, the sustainability of koha rests in reciprocity. Receiving and giving in kind, forging ongoing relationships, and through mana enhancing exchanges of mana, reputation, and brand. People hear your words, but they follow who you are. The transactions of koha atu, gifting out koha mai, koha atu, koha mai. Uh, the other partners don't quite get that. Molly have got flat noses because they come in through the aroha door, the gifting going, when we go back, bang, it's so hard. So, and it is such a pleasure and a humble pleasure to be in front of with you all and to be speaking on this platform and to be able to finish and start and finish with the words of my grandfather. Trust me, when I was a kid and he told me that, I thought, you can forget that. There's no way I'm going to. And now the boy is going up that platform that I shared with you. So I'll end with that karaki again. Tēnei au te hokai nei, te hokai nuku, te hokai rangi. Te hokai nā taku tūpū nā tāne nui a rangi, te kiti ai te rangi tū hā hā ti te tehi o mano. I roko ki nā tū rāko i o matua kore anu. I rido anga ki to te wānanga, ko te ki te tū auri, ko te ki te tū ate, ko te ki te aronui. I tiri, tiri ai paupau ai ki a papatūna, ko kāputu ko tiri tangata ki te whai au te mārama, ti hei māwiri au. Tu hei tāna. Thank you so much, Piripi, <laughs> immensely. I, I, Nifa and Andreas are here already. If uh, Professor Glavovich is around, who is also one of the co-conspirators, of the webinar, I invite him to join. He's also in New Zealand. Um, if he can join with with video, uh, immense, immense uh, uh, incantation. I feel like both Nephi and you uh, get, were really providing us a, a spoken word and and sheer poetry in just manifesting the words. I I I will let them speak i just wanted to ask you one thing listening to you and and this is not the first time i i wonder if i'm too naive or if i am correct to believe that words uh, themselves even when i don't understand them uh have an effect on my interiority uh is that okay to think and to believe that you know your words that you were pronouncing even when I couldn't follow, they still enter into my interiority and heart and have an effect, even without understanding the meaning. So I feel like I believe that uh, fully. I just wonder if I'm too naive. You are so humble, my brother. You are so humble. Truth has a, truth has a vibration, man. And as I look at it, you know, one of the things when I was a kid, because I couldn't, my English was terrible. My mom went off the top, right? And um, whether well, I knew I was hungry. So I was just dyslexic, really, in English. And I can hear you because I can undo your dy dy dyslexia in Māori. <laughs> when we speak, a, brother, we speak a universal language. We all do. And, and again, I, you know, looking at this... <laughs> I want to just get the lightsaber going left, right, and send him. And I tell you, it's uh, 
it's a warm thing. So my my point to you, my brother, of course you can feel it. Of course you can. You are it. It is you. It is us. It's all of us. I hope that's adequate as a response, brother. Absolutely, it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'll let Nephi and uh, Andreas uh, interject with whatever they feel like. Yeah, I'd like to add. Thank you for the, the prayers and sharing your language. It was uh, very powerful. Uh, I, I too felt it. Um, I was sitting there thinking of our own prayers in Apache and Navajo that I've heard you know, all my life and couldn't understand, but I could feel it. So I really appreciate your presentation. Thank you, brother. Brother, thank you so much, man. I can't wait till we mix it up and, and go and do some good stuff out there. Man. And uh, Maori come from a long line of big eaters, brother. I can't wait to sit down at the table for you. <laughs> yeah. Andreas. Yeah, I'm, I'm so moved. I'm so grateful. And, um, you know, it is so important that that we do feel this and and that it happens and we feel it. And, and, and you know, it's so it makes me so happy that, that this this is here. And um, and we are we are we are in a scientific conference, you know, and we're doing this. That's so powerful because that's that's our. You know, as you said, you of course you feel it you are it it is all of us you know that's 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 what we can feel what we can do and what can call us back to do it and 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 so it's it's you know we have this organ to feel it uh which is the heart <laughs> you also you also use the word and and it touched it touched my heart what you because there was power in it which touches the heart so the heart can receive this and the heart can give this and 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 if you if you encounter a butterfly flapping its wings at the end of summer, then it touches your heart as well. And and you know it's that is what us what points us to the truth. And that's what we've been missing. And we need to find it. So we need to do it. And it has happened here. And that makes me so happy. And um, wonderful. And and uh, you know, Dehan, it's so great that you that you you ask for the permission to feel it <laughs> because you did you know and and um and we have this permission and we need to you know that's that's where we have to go yeah thanks so wonderful i'm made me really happy made me also very sad but that's it meets at some point sure andreas you know one of the things i usually have with our learners is that we've got these Colored lights, not traffic lights, <laughs> and the black. After I put it, says black has got nothing, man. <laughs> Red between the darkness of the night and the white of the day. The darkness is our is our, our ancestors, and uh, the women have the mana in that realm. It's a whole different story, man. I tell you, intuition, everything. And then the red, the red is the middle where that joins night and day betwixt heaven and earth. That's our ancestors. Keep an eye on this, and then yeah. the. Then the green, that's when you, you, we've got it. And the green is is to be uh, our, our birds. They have green feathers, right? And the red feathers, they're a big deal to us. So you come from a little beep, 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 where you're just basically a little sewer that's hungry, right? And then when you fly and you see the feathers, you see the red as they, are, they open up. That's what you do. So if it's black, you got nothing. If it's red, you're getting there. And if it's green, you're flying with that, so that's my last little tip test. I want to confess something, man. I was looking at the lineup. I, I said to uh, Simon, Simon, who got me linked up, I said, man, I don't mind being the frog in this deal. But I was looking at the, at the line, so I'm really glad and humbled to be amongst you all. You know. Honored to yeah. have you. I, I think we are beyond any academic pro, pro or professional uh, webinar type of thing. I only regret that we can't use our skateboards here, uh, but maybe some some other uh, <laughs> other place to meet at the ramps. Um, our place, our place is famous for surfing. Raglan on the west coast, famous, well even, famous. Bring the boards, bring the boards. Even better, even better for us in the <laughs> skateboards and or, or on the coast surfings. Um, 
I'll read one question from from Bruce uh, that was for Nephi, but it applies also to you, PDP, for, in your opinion. First of all, Bruce says, PDP, thank you for your gift. Your Corero brings life to this webinar. I truly appreciate it. Um, and now the question was originally for Nephi. I wonder if you might reflect on how you engage with the challenge of communal or collective emancipation amid, amidst this violence. Beyond our personal journey, how do we contribute to our shared responsibility and collective struggle against these waves of violence? Yeah, I, I saw that question and it was striking because it's it's the next wave of work for us. Mm. Um, this this first step that we're that I was talking about in the messaging is, is the on the home front. The next wave is the um, at the policy level, at the decision making level, and it really shows us how far we've got to go. Um, so it's kind of hopefully amplifying the message to be able to make the larger impact on our world. Um, I think keeping it simple is one of some of the best ways to do it. So keeping these concepts and themes in sight, in mind, uh, in, uh, in all different ways. Um, a, <clears throat> a colleague of mine, indigenous colleague of mine, used the phrase, our front lines are everywhere. So our front lines are in every, every institution, every power structure, every food label, every farm. There's uh, every school and every age group. So um, we've got a lot of work to do and liberation is multidimensional. Um, so I feel like how we contribute, uh, we can make an impact in an everyday level, but um, in our local environments, that's kind of what I put in there where it says uh, place-based renewal. Um, we got to, you know, develop strategies and approaches to be able to, to, to make that happen in our regions first and create models to, to carry it out. So having a sense of courage and responsibility, I think, I think is very important because it's scary. It threatens our livelihood sometimes. It really does because we're challenging the norm. So be courageous, um, operate according to principle and push forward. You're not alone. Beautiful, clearly, clearly said. I'd like to just add to uh, grab onto the 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 hairs of my brother's legs and and the coattails and come back with the with the finisher on that <laughs> and um and say that we have a saying e hara taku to i te to takitahi do not stand alone I didn't just land on top of the mountain there was a whole legacy that came here to go through our kids 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 legacy and we're all part of the of that legacy. And will never, ever, ever, ever go away. Ever. The bloodline of nobility will always continue. And, you know, we can have all of the noise in the world and everything else. I also want to make a real big point here. When I'm talking about the white guys, I'm talking about an ideology. Right? And brother, and if I, you know, we're all brothers and sisters under the sun and under the skin. That, that was at home, tui eirunga, tui eiraro, tai and everything above, tui eiraro below, tui eiro to within, tui eiro and without. Karongo te po, because all of our answers come here, karongo te ao, and so does our environment. And the question really remains, can we hear? Thank you. I, I think it's best to stop here. Um, <laughs> honestly, um, uh, welcome, Simonetta. Professor Moore is here. Mm, uh, thank I thank just want to say thank you all. It's been a wonderful, a wonderful lecture, and uh, I appreciate all your contributions. Thank you, Diane, for organizing this with Bruce Glavovich, who, who's in the audience. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you to the audience who is still here uh, all over the world, uh, whatever time zone they are in. I hope you have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, uh, and uh, and hope to see you cross paths somewhere, uh, especially with with the panelists as well. Um, I, I will be in touch. So grateful that that you were here. I know Bruce uh, is grateful as well. And I have no doubt we'll, we'll cross paths again. 
uh, you amplified me, you enhanced me, to use your words. And, and I think uh, the, the space of everyone who was here. So thank you very much. Um, stay well. Thank you. 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 Thank you.